So uh, <clears throat> it's the end of week eight here. We're rounding out the uh, sort of last, last few lectures here. We've got a couple of assignments and the final left over. So I gave you the uh, overview of what the roadmap for that looks like uh, last Monday, but just kind of a quick recap of that. We've got assignment six coming in over the weekend, and then we'll have assignment seven going out uh, pretty much right after that. We'll, we're, you know, we're trying to give you a few extra days uh, for assignment seven, since that is kind of a, just a little bigger project, and also um, an opportunity for you to kind of experiment a little more, sort of try different, different techniques. So just trying to give you a, a good amount of time for that. That'll come in the last day of classes, um, so the Wednesday, uh, the first, right? And then our final uh, is on the last day of final week, so that's Wednesday the 8th. Okay, okay. so let's get into, let's just get into the material today. Uh, so last time I talked to you about uh, managing the heap, I talked to you about just sort of the um, sort of the high, high level sort of design ideas behind writing malloc, realloc, and free. Um, today is going to be a completely different topic, but still very related, which is how, for any program, and that will include uh, certainly heap allocator, how do we look at, it, how do we make the program run faster? Um, so we'll, we'll be looking at the, so the term, of course, is optimizations. We've referred to this throughout the quarter already is, you know, uh, um, in a couple of different ways. And now we're going to look at, um, now we're going to look at it formally. So here, so the, here are the three kind of big picture goals for today. Um, the first of them is, is we have to have some idea of how exactly we are, we're going to quantify performance to begin with. And so we've certainly referred at times to uh, optimization. We've referred to performance. We've said, oh, your program has to run within two or three x. Uh, the time the solution takes uh, has to use you know, memory efficiency and so on. But really, what does it mean to write an efficient program? What are the ways that we can actually measure that so that we can look at something that we've done and say, yes, our program got faster, or no, this, this didn't actually help. Uh, and so then the base having gotten that understanding, we're going to look at kind of two broad categories of, of optimizations um, here. The first is, what, do, what can the compiler do for us? Um, so there's a nice, pretty broad set of things that GCC is just going to be able to help us with that we don't have to, and in a lot of ways shouldn't really um, worry about. If it's something that the compiler can get right, then maybe you know we shouldn't twist our code into some bizarre state just so that we hypothetically get that, um, get the optimization from it. Um, and then, but then there is going to be a category of things that uh, the compiler is not going to be able to help us with. And I want to make sure we spend a lot of time, first of all, understanding, you know, how do we recognize those kinds of issues? And then how do we find, how do we like find them in our code? So given just a, an, a big, program, how do we know where the compiler is giving us help and where it's not? Okay. So let me get into it and start talking about measuring performance. Uh, so far, you know, we haven't talked about performance at all um, really throughout 107. So pro most likely your exposure to talking about efficiency or runtime efficiency and performance of programs has been in terms of big O notation. So from 106 B or X, you, you know, you, you've talked about, um, you talked about big O as a really convenient way to look at an algorithm and say sort of how, how efficient that algorithm is rel in terms of how uh, the performance will change as the size of the input to that algorithm grows. So, we're, so big O is really thinking about the kind of asymptotic growth of, of your input. Like if I pass my, my function uh, an array that's twice the size, is it going to become twice as slow? Or is it going to be four times slower? Is it going to be you know, uh, something much worse, right? Um, something like exponentially slower and so on. Big O is, is a really nice 
uh, is a nice technique because it's machine and language independent. So I can, you know, even just write some little piece of pseudocode and say, all right, tell me what the big O running time of this program, uh, this function is going to be. And you don't have to ask me things like, well, gosh, what compiler are you using? And what assembly language is this going to be compiled to? And what are the, how many registers does the machine have? None of those questions ever came into the picture when talking about big O, which means that when we look at something like two different algorithms, we're trying to compare merge sort and selection sort or insertion sort, well, we can say clearly merge sort is going to run faster asymptotically than selection sort because of these, you know, this sort of runtime. And I don't have to worry about, well, but what if your machine had twice as many registers? Would it still run faster? Um, the big O, uh, you know, the theory folks can say, yes, it will still run faster. Don't worry. Um, the big O uh, is, 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 you know, clearly different. And so we can, and so that's still going to be important, right? And, you know, we'll see a couple of examples today with algorithms and the algorithmic efficiency of your program. What is the big O running time? Are you doing something in quadratic time that could be done in linear time? That's still going to be very, very important. Um, but that's not the only thing. That's not the only way we can talk about performance. And so the limitations of big O are that, well, now we do have an understanding of what our machine is doing. We do know about our assembly language. And when talking about performance at this level, at kind of the systems level, we want to be able to say, ah, this block of assembly is faster than this other block of assembly, even if the C code was the same. And, and so Big O is not going to be able to help us with that. Moreover, you know, with Big O, it made sense to throw away constant factors. It made sense to say, yeah, 2n squared, 3n squared, who cares? It's all kind of quadratic time. What matters is the growth. And that's true, except 100n squared is a lot worse than 1n squared. Right? It really is. And in, and in the case where we're looking at, when we're, we're, we're thinking about optimizations at, at this level of like, how should I change my code or how should I change, um, or how should I change the assembly? We do need to start taking those constant factors um, into consideration. And when we write substantial programs, you know, that need to run within milliseconds, if you think about like a Google search engine kind of a program that really does have to complete in a very small amount of real time. They can't just say, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's O of N, that's good enough. All right, that's not really going to work. Um, so what are the alternatives? All right, so let's, you know, so here are a couple of alternatives. I'll, I'll sort of talk through them. One a sort of obvious alternative is just to take out our stopwatch and just kind of go, right? Like I push start when I hit enter on my, my keyboard, and then when the program stops, I look at the time and I <laughs> use that. In a lot of ways, that's often what we actually want to get at, right? So if you think about, uh, if we think about response times for something like um, a web page or a server, often what we're eventually trying to get at is wall clock time. Uh, if I have to wait 10 seconds for a web page to load as a user, I'm not going to. I'm going to go to a different web page. And so to that extent, wall clock time may be the right metric for that kind of thing. But the problem with just using our stopwatch is that it's, is that clock time is, is going to be pretty, pretty high variance. Um, in particular, it'll depend on things like whether other people are using the same machine. So if 10 people are using this one machine and that machine only has you know, one core, then everybody's program is going to get 10 times slower. But that shouldn't count against the program. We shouldn't take that, we don't want to take that into consideration when thinking about whether our program is, whether we're, we're doing well or not with the optimization. So, Maybe we might say, okay, well, here's an alternative. We now know about assembly, and we know that assembly instructions are what's actually executing on the machine. So let's consider just measuring the number of instructions that execute for our program. 
right? So every time I execute another line of assembly, I'll just count that as one. And then when my program finishes, I'll say, yeah, the program ran a million instructions. This other program ran 100,000 instructions. So we can say that program B was 10 times faster than program A. The problem with that, and we'll start to see a, uh, an example of this, um, is that even though up until now, we've kind of pretended that every instruction is, takes the same amount of time, that's actually not true. So what we're actually going to do, um, I'm just kind of trying, I want to introduce this metric as one that we'll be using uh, throughout uh, today. Well, we're actually going to, one, one really nice strategy that we can use um, is that, so our, all of our processors have the notion of a cycle. And so we can think of this cycle as sort of the smallest unit of the smallest unit that can be executed on the processor um, in one step. We can think of, so if you, if you, you know, were to go out and buy a, a computer and, you know, somebody told you, oh yeah, this computer is really great because it has a three gigahertz processor. What we're actually saying there is that in one second, that computer could execute three billion cycles. Now, that's not to say that it could execute 3 billion instructions, but if the instructions were really simple, like, for example, add could execute probably in one cycle, like just adding a, a number to a register, then, you know, then, then that's, so then, then it, yes, it would be able to execute 3 billion of those, but then other instructions that would be more expensive, um, it will not be able to. So this, the, but this unit will allow us to kind of specify a, uh, a, a metric for understanding the performance of our, of our program that is, that it is dependent on our machine, right? So we couldn't say that, well, my computer has a three gigahertz processor, therefore it's going to be three times faster than my phone, which has a one gigahertz processor. That is not an accurate comparison. Oops. Uh, but when, but when actually thinking about the, uh, when trying to think about looking at assembly, when trying to look at a particular program, we can, we can use the number of cycles as a metric for, um, as, as, as one of the metrics. And I'll show you all of these um, when we get into it. I just want to introduce some terms to you, um, ideas of a, what a cycle is, um, and, and so on. Yeah? Okay. All right. So um, let me actually just switch over. Uh, I'm going to do a lot of stuff in code today. Um, but so let me just switch over right now and just kind of start talking through a couple of, a couple of pieces of code and how, and how we're, what our general methodology is going to be, our, like our process for the day. So I'll pull up um, demo.c. And so the plan is that I've got a couple of different, of, at least for the first part of the lecture, I've got a few different sort of small code snippets for um, showing different kinds of optimizations, uh, different kinds of things that maybe the compiler can and sometimes cannot do. Um, and I will, I want to run each of these optimization, each of these programs, and then I want to ask the processor. So in terms of actually using these performance metrics, right? So wall clock time, okay, I could just pull out a stopwatch and just watch the time. Uh, but so what do we actually do? How do we know how many cycles were executed for uh, a particular uh, function. Well, we kind of have to ask the processor that, right? Only really the processor knows, like, oh yeah, I spent 100 cycles on this or, or 300 on that. And so fortunately, there's a nice little uh, set of functions um, that we can use to, to, do that, to do that measurement. So our plan is going to be to run one of these functions. Um, we have to run it a, a few times. I'll show you the, the broad kind of loop really quickly here. Um, but the, the general structure, I'll just pick one of these, it doesn't matter. Um, the general structure is we'll, we need to run this, you know, uh, just to decrease the variance, we'll run this function a few times, and then we'll ask the processor how many cycles uh, that total run took, right? That's kind of with these, you know, start counter, get counter. And then we'll try to kind of average out and say, all right, for any, for one of the trials, for one run of this function, how many cycles was that? Okay. So let me get into some of these optimizations. So the first part of the lecture is going to be about what the compiler is able to do. Um, and so we're going to we're going to start this conversation with, you know, optimizations actually that we've 
already seen kind of throughout the quarter. So for uh, throughout the quarter, we've been running, we've been running the our, all of our compilations with a flag minus OG. Maybe I'll pull up the slide for the the list of flags here. Um, so here's a list of the compiler optimization flags uh, that we could use. Um, so O0, which we've been avoiding because it generates a lot of messy assembly, is actually telling the compiler, you know, don't do anything, don't do any optimizations. Uh, but because that ends up with kind of messy assembly, we skip that level. And uh, for this entire quarter, we've been running at OG. And what OG says is, let's go ahead and let the compiler ha do some stuff, and we'll see the extent to which it will really do stuff, um, the extent to which it will optimize. But don't mess with our debugging too much. So what this means is it's not just going to like throw out our function entirely um, in the interest of optimizations. So, so we can still kind of use GDB. We can still kind of look at local variables and stuff like that, um, but get a little bit of cleaner assembly and just sort of better performance out of that. And then there are levels kind of beyond that for like, no, no, I really want you to just go all in, right? Like, give me everything, every kind of performance optimization you could come up with, um, which I should note, they don't always help, right? Sometimes, like, these are, all these optimizations are going to be based on heuristics. And one of the first things we want to look at is going to be, you know, what can the compiler do and what can it figure out from our code? Um, and like, what is it allowed to do? So a lot of the kind of playing with flags is going to be uh, trying different levels and seeing how well it works out. So let me just uh, jump into the first example here. Um, so the first set of things are actually going to be optimizations that we've already, the compiler's already been doing for us. So let me show you this first block of code, right? Here we've got, uh, a block of code that's based on a parameter, but you'll notice that the vast majority of the code in this function is just a constant, right? So a is a constant. Um, a times size of arr um, is also a constant. The square root of two is actually also a constant, right? Yes, it's calling the square root function, but you know, unless but. The compiler knows what square root does. It's part of the math library. And so the only thing in this function that really depends on the parameter is this piece. Right? Everything else about this function is a constant. So what can the compiler do to this, uh, to this code? And so rather than run it, actually, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna show you the disassembly because I think that's more, um, Meaningful. So I'll just go into GDB and I'll disassemble this function. And we can actually see, so this is at OG, so I should say I, I have not actually turned on any additional optimization flags. I'm just using the flags that we have been using throughout the quarter. And even at that level, the compiler's already said, look, I, I got constants. Constants are fine. Um, and so what did it do? Well, it does the one piece that does depend on the parameter. Uh, this is a slightly awkward kind of three argument version of multiply, but um, nevertheless, uh, it says, all right, the one piece that depended on the parameter was uh, taking param and multiplying it by a, which it already kind of filled in with the 107, 0x107. And then it took all of this other stuff and just said, yeah, that is equal to this, I'm done. Neat. Right. So this is an optimization called constant folding. Um, and and that's the idea is we have a bunch of constants and it will just kind of combine them all together and, and do this all at compile time so that now our assembly, right, is pretty much, it's just going to execute these three instructions. Um, I could show you how well it performs if you want. I could run demo. I'll just pass it CF. And we can see that, you know, okay, it's like 11 cycles. Um, that's, there's a little bit of, so, so this is, 11 cycles, this is already suggesting that maybe, you know, one of these instructions might not be as cheap as some of the other ones. So maybe the iMole is taking up a few more cycles than, um, than we might have otherwise wanted. Uh, but that, so that's something to keep in mind. But 
But in general, that's certainly going to be a lot faster than if I actually had to call Sterlen and do the division and, um, and so on, right? So far, so good? Question? Yep. Uh, how does the compiler know to call Sterlen if that's a library function and we haven't done the linking yet? Oh, that's a great question. So how come the, so the compiler, so I called Sterlin here, and you're basically saying, well, how does it know what that's, that that's okay, right? So this is kind of getting into that question of like, okay, so what is the compiler really allowed to do? Is it really allowed to, like, how, why is it allowed to make the Sterlin disappear despite the fact that we haven't linked with libc? You're absolutely right. Like, Sterlin has not come in yet. And, and the same really applies to square root. In fact, there's kind of something, really weird going on, which is that square root isn't even linked by default, right? So really, is it, does it actually get to, to kind of do this? Um, and so as it turns out, there's the rule with the C language sort of is that, like, the C language specified all of these library functions. It specified square root. It specified Sterlin. And so, and the, so the compiler gets to assume that Sterlin does exactly what it thinks it does. And it gets to assume that square root does exactly what it thinks it does. Um, and so in this case, it's basically preempting the library entirely. It's preempting just even before, before linking, right? Before anything happens with the library, it's just the compiler is just going to say, I know what Sterlin does because it's a library function that we all agree does this one thing, which is take the length of a string. So if you ask me to take Sterlin of the string hello, I know that any rational Sterlin implementation is going to return 5. Right? So it gets to make that assumption. If we called some other function, then it wouldn't be able to quite do that. Question? Yep. So about um, how the compiler figure this out before linking, yeah. does that mean like in this example you wouldn't necessarily have to link with like LM? Yeah, so, it, it, so, the, question, so the question is, in, in this case, does that mean we don't actually have to link with LM? Um, yeah, I actually can't. I think I turned it on anyway, um, but I can't actually remember. We can look at the NM to see if it comes out. I don't think it will. So let's run NM on demo uh, dot O. And um, yeah, we can actually see that there's no square root in there. Right? So sure enough, we would not have to link. I could just build it, right? NM demo dot O. So I'm just going to try to link this thing. Yeah. Uh, ooh. Oh. Right, right, sorry, I got a link with the left side. There we go, yeah, so I do not need to put LM, you're right. Um, because it just made it go away. Question. Yep. Can you explain, what, you just like clarify what a cycle represents or like what that length of time is determined by? So, so the question is what exactly does a cycle represent? So it's, it's every processor is sort of, I guess like, at the hardware level, like, the processor has this kind of, kind of like a clock that's going to, like the processor can do a certain amount of work in one step. Um, and, and the processor's kind of, you know, kind of like the, the running of the processor is regulated by a, a clock, which is why we say that um, my processor, let's say, has a, you know, two gigahertz processor, so that we're saying that the, the clock kind of ticks, you know, two billion times every second. And so within that one cycle, right, within that one you know, tick of, of time, there's a certain amount that the processor can do. And the amount depends on um, from one processor to another. Um, but we can think of it as, for a given machine, it's sort of the smallest amount of work that machine can do um, in, one, in one, one step. And so when I, so we're mostly going to use it kind of as a relative metric, right? Like, we're not going to go and say, oh, this thing ran in 11 cycles. And that means that, you know, like in some absolute sense that this is good or bad. Um, but when comparing programs on the same machine, we can use this as kind of a relative metric for how much processor time we used up. Anything else? So another example of, so this is a, an example of the kind of optimization that the compiler just gets to do based, of, based on, you know, it, the compiler knows the language, the compiler knows uh, constant values, it knows how to do math, and in some kind of broad sense, you might say, yeah, okay, this seems reasonable, right? Like, I, I wrote some code out that 
you know, maybe I wrote it like this because I thought it was easier to read than just putting some big constant in there. Um, but the compiler was able to say, yeah, well, this if I just compute all of this, these values ahead of time, um, then I will produce an equivalent piece of code. Right. And so hopefully this kind of encourages you in a sense that, well, it's OK to write code that might look inefficient or might look like it's going to require a lot of computation. You might look at this block of code and say, gosh, that seems like it's going to take a long time to run. So maybe I should do the math ahead of time and you know, not write it into my code. Well, we don't have to worry about that. If this was, for some reason, the most logical way to write your program, then you should just write it that way because the compiler will get it right. The compiler will clean it up for you. Right. Um, so you know, here's another example of that where, so this is called uh, common sub-expression elimination. The idea is you'll notice that we've got this value, this param2 plus 107. It's going to be used kind of all over the place in our, in our code. And so there's nothing about the, the language that says that the compiler really needs to recalculate this every time. Right? What benefit is there to recalculating this if the value is never going to change? Nothing changes param2. Right? It's a local variable. So why would it, why would it ever change? Um, so it would be reasonable for the compiler to just not recalculate. So we can look at the assembly here. And sure enough, uh, it calculates, or it does the 107 plus param2 right there, and then it never uses the value 107 ever again. It's just going to keep um, recycling that. It also actually, in fact, noticed that we don't even use param2 after that, so it can just reuse that register. So even more fancy. All right. So are they good? OK. Um, one last kind of little, um, well, OK. So let me actually do, oops. I think some of these are, um, yeah. So one, um, let, let me switch over. So here's here's some stuff. So here's another uh, another kind of optimization that you know we can kind of look at uh, as. So this is going to be where. So we were talking about when I said sort of that some instructions don't actually um, are are not. The same, not all instructions are the same cost, right? That, and I alluded to multiply and by extension divide are actually both fairly expensive instructions. So let me kind of show you, let me show you this function. I'm going to use disassemble uh, with the C code to kind of show you what this looks like. Um, so I can kind of scroll up a little bit. And so we can kind of see here, so I'm trying to do a multiply by seven, and we can see that. The compiler really didn't want to do that. It said, no, I, I don't really want to use an iMole because iMole is, is more expensive. Um, and so as long as I can produce the same result, right, I'm just going to make a change. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, do, I'm going to multiply the number by 8 instead using this fancy LEA thing. And then I'm going to subtract one uh, copy from it. And so that's equivalent to multiplying by 7. Right? And then this one is even more interesting. When I do this divide, you'd think, OK, well, surely like some amount of you know, just calling a divide wouldn't be a big deal, right? But divide is actually going to be one of our, the most expensive instructions. And so it, it <laughs> uh, I'm not actually going to go into exactly how this got calculated. But what it basically did is it multiplied by the reciprocal instead. So it's doing this really fancy thing where it's going to say, well, actually, what I can do is I can sort of do this binary multiply by one third. And that's going to be as good as dividing by three. And despite the fact that there are clearly way more instructions here than if I just called div, this is apparently going to be faster. <laughs> right. So that's so. These are some examples of the things that the compiler will just do, and it's and as far as we're concerned, given that we're always running at OG, these are things that the compiler is just doing unconditionally. Like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna generate, uh, you know, I'm gonna generate this uh, multiply by one third instead of this divide by three because I, I know that it's faster. Um, I know that the three is a constant, and I'm good with that. Question. Yep. How exactly um, does 
Does the compiler do like divide and multiply without just breaking it down into those steps that we're seeing here? Like, is, is does it have like a separate process for like dividing and multiplying? Because like, wouldn't it still just be able to like add and subtract things and move things? Um. Well, so the. So there, there are two, there are two, keep in mind that what we're seeing here is the assembly that the compiler generated. This is the code that will be run when I, you know, run the program. There is kind of another step, right, where the compiler, where during the compilation, where the compiler is just looking at our code and trying to figure out kind of what it does. And during that step, right, uh, that, that step is all written in C. So in that case, anything that the compiler could do up front um, you know, could kind of get offloaded into the into the compilation step, where that C code is just kind of going to do it. And how does the C code do it? Well, I mean, that C code itself got compiled to assembly, and, and it, that will run too. But but you know, it can use kind of the normal. I can just it can do multiplies and divides and shifts and all that, right? Yeah. Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, so when a program finished being debugged and it's like kind of ready for, say, like, a yeah. release or something, yeah. then would you always want to use the maximum level of optimization to make sure it runs the quickest? Yeah, so the question is, so okay, once the program is, you know, once we're happy with it, wouldn't we want to use um, just a really high level of optimization? Generally, yes. Um, and then that's, so, but the question is, like, so, and we'll start seeing a, maybe, you know, maybe we'll see an example of this uh, today. i not exactly, I don't know if I can get, get, quite one to work, but as we go, the problem is as you go up higher and higher levels of optimization, optimization is not kind of a like flip the switch and everything works kind of process. Um, and especially like, so uh, O2, for example, which is sort of the standard level of optimization that our compiler can use, that that's pretty safe and it's probably going to help. Uh, but if you start just like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, O3 or O4 or see what happens, um, there's actually a risk that the the more the higher levels of optimization because the compiler is really just kind of basing everything on heuristics right at the end of the day it doesn't really know what your program is doing so it can't say for with certainty that doing one thing versus another will absolutely make your program run faster in all cases so as we go up higher and higher levels of optimization um, we're starting to get into more kind of experimental areas where the optimization might actually hurt you which is why I mean, yes, like if our goal were to have our program run, run as fast as it can, which seems like a reasonable goal, that we would want to start kind of playing with different optimization levels and different, different techniques uh, to see if we can kind of get there. But it's not going to be as simple as just, you know, set the flag and walk away. Right. Anything else? And so here, I kind of wanted to show you with this block of assembly, and it is kind of reordering it, I think, uh, but that's okay. I, I want to show you that with this block of assembly here, down here, uh, the, the C code here, we've got a for loop uh, that's going through and calculating, you know, um, I times 107 and whatnot uh, inside, this, inside this loop. In this case, the compiler decided it did not want to mess with our loop. Um, and so, you know, for better or worse, right, this is not, um, this is, Probably because when we asked it to optimize, but to keep kind of our debugging ability intact, one of the really useful pieces of, you know, that we would care about when debugging is that we kind of want our for loops to stay for loops. We kind of want to be able to look at the value of i, for example. Um, we kind of want to, you know, so, so if the compiler got a little too aggressive here, uh, it could, you know, kind of start just, making this all, um, it could make our lives as, you know, for debugging a little bit harder. So let me show you, let me actually just, let me run that one and show you what kind of happens here. So I'm going to run this on, so this is the, uh, so strength reduction, uh, there's a comment in the, the text, but strength reduction refers to, um, you know, ch choosing instructions that are faster than others. So here we've got, you know, so we see that if I run, the code that I was showing you up here, um, we're taking 65 cycles. I've got another version of the code, which I've compiled O2. Oops. So this version has been compiled with a more aggressive uh, optimize, optimization. Let's see how much, how long it takes to run the same function. Well, look at that, right? So we get a we get a 8x speed up just like that, right? Hey, cool, right? If only it was, we're always that easy, 
um, let's see what it actually decided to do to our code. So let's disassemble SR. And so we can kind of see, I guess I could try that, the slash M thing. Um, actually, I don't even know if this, let's see how the slash M comes out because, so now, okay, so you can kind of see where the, uh, all right, so that return is okay. Um, it's, you know, maybe up front kind of like, I, I won't, so as we get kind of deeper and deeper into like more and more optimizations, we're gonna start getting kind of really wacky, um, some slightly potentially weird instructions like, wow, okay, yeah, that got kind of, that, that sort of picked up pretty quickly there. Um, the one thing to notice about the disassembly here, uh, there's no multiply, despite the fact that the, you know, the compiler has claimed that these five lines somehow correspond with this line, right? So you can see that kind of, you know, our ability to debug this code kind of went down, went downhill a little bit. Um, we can't really look at I and understand like what exactly it's doing. I can tell you that what this code is actually doing is instead of tracking I, um, what the compiler got to do is it basically says, all right, well, you're going from I equals zero less than or equal to to param two. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to make another variable, and that variable is just going to count up by 107 every time, right? So instead of taking 0x 107 times i, I'm just going to take this other variable, and I'm just going to keep adding 0x 107 to it. Adds are easy, multiplies are hard. So as long as I add once every time I go through this loop, that's it's going to work. And you know, this is maybe where we start kind of getting into this, this space of thinking, wow, really? Is the compiler allowed to do that? Like, it's allowed to just introduce some new local variables, and it's allowed to, like, just kind of, you know, structure our, our code around a little. And the reality is, who's noticing, right? And this is kind of going to be a, a pretty big systems principle, uh, you know, if you continue in, like, 110 and 140 and things like that. We're just going to see this come back over and over again. If no one can tell what's going on, if no one's looking, and, and sort of debuggers don't count in, in, this, in this sense, right? If no one's looking at our code, our code gets to do kind of whatever it wants. And so the compiler does not have to worry about us going in in GDB and like poking around at values for I and things like that. It gets to just say, yeah, this is going to be faster. No one should be looking at what's happening inside this function. As long as the function produces the same result, we're all cool. Right, I'm allowed to do this. Let me show you an even more extreme example of that. Actually, it doesn't look like it's going to fit totally. So let's let me let me pull up the code over here. Over here, I have examples of you know so so here. For example, this if statement, right? If param1 is less than param2 and it's greater than param2, and 1 is greater than param2, clearly that's never going to happen, right? And then here I've got this weird for loop here where, you know, maybe I thought, oh, I just want to sit here and spin for a little while, you know? Like, let me just kind of just burn up some time and, and whatever. And here, you know, okay, well, you'll notice what is this if else really doing? Right? In both cases, the result is going to be the same. It's just going to increment uh, param1. Um, and then here's the last one where I've got, uh, if the param1 is equal to 0, I can return 0. If it's not equal to 0, I'll return param1. And so these are all cases where you might think, well, OK, you know, I wrote the code this way. What could the compiler really do? And we saw at, at OG that it, you know, it really wanted to keep our control structures the same. Um, I won't show you the one for OG for, for this function, but the con nowhere in the contract when we, you know, start when, with the compiler, does it say that, the, that it needs to keep all of our control structures. It doesn't say that we, when I write an if statement, it has to generate an if statement. And when I write a for loop, it has to generate a for loop. So let's look at the disassembly for DC. Oh, look at that. That's it. There's no loop. There's no if statement. There's no compare. There's nothing. So what did we lose? Well, okay, I can do, I could try the disassemble slash m. I doubt this is going to come out very well. So here we can already see, like, you know, debugging is kind of a mess, right? It basically looks like it skipped this entire block, which it did. Um, and so, you know, 
it the compiler gets to just say, oh, like, this block of code, never going to happen. If I know it's never going to happen, you know, I get to assume that you're not in a debugger and you're not staring at the assembly and kind of trying to, you know, follow, follow the code as I'm, as I'm going through it. I get to just say, yeah, this is never going to happen, so I'm just going to get rid of it. I'm just not going to do it. This for loop, that doesn't do anything. That has no effect on the observable output, right? So if we kind of just back up and go sort of the first step, you know, of this, of, of really thinking about optimization is what exactly does this function do? What output does it create? Well, this print isn't going to happen, so that's, that's not happening. Um, this doesn't have an effect on the output. This line will increment the ultimate return value by one. But in the end, this function really does just return param one plus one, right? And so, hey, I'm just going to do that. And that, yeah, that's a weird thing that uh, it's doing. So, so there you have it, right? So, and sometimes it can be, you know, it can be pretty surprising um, that it's that it's even allowed to do that, right? Question so far? Yep. Um, if you were using this code to like power a device or something where delays actually do matter, then <laughs> yeah. how, like, how would that work? Yeah. So the question is like, well, hey, I like, what if I actually had a situation where delay mattered, right? Um, so like, if I actually cared about looping around for a while, um, then this is a case where maybe I would have to not compile with optimizations. Um, or I would have to find some other function that allowed me to delay my program in a more uh, useful way than, like, so you, so you could sort of mark this function as please don't touch this function, I really do care about timing. Um, this actually does come up in sort of security contexts. So there are situations where, um, depending on how quickly your program runs, um, a hacker might be able to figure out what code path it took and things like that. Um, so in cases where timing matters, yeah, like we do actually need to, get the optimizer to stop screwing with our code and, and let us actually, uh, you know, write, let, let it, and ha force it to actually generate code that does exactly um, the sequence of operations that we need. In the absolute worst case, we could write the assembly ourselves. Um, there's probably a better way, um, like turning off optimizations for that file. Um, but yeah, those are, those are absolutely considerations we need, to, we need to make here. Okay, other questions? Okay. So, uh, last example in the way of sort of compiler-related optimizations um, that I want to I want to do um, is so here I'm actually just I'm not going to do the assembly. Um, I'm just going to run demo, and what we're going to do here is it's going to just be what we're doing is it's a, your standard factorial. Let me, you know, so this is your standard factorial. I have it written in two different ways. I've got it written recursively. And I've got it written iteratively, right? And so you, I think you already saw this example in lab, but let's kind of now we can really talk about sort of the, the optimizations that are happening behind the scenes here. So I'm going to run it kind of. Uh, I'm going to run the. I want to call it the non-optimized one, but we already saw that it is kind of optimizing, and we can see that there's actually a pretty substantial difference uh, between the recursive version and the iterative one, right? Um, that the recursion is taking substantially longer, it's taking about uh, 3x longer, right, than the iterative version. Um, and overall, both are, both are taking a, a good amount. I think I did factorial of like a few thousand or something, something really large, right? So what could the optimizer really do here? You know, like, what can it do to our recursion? Well, it turns out it can do a lot to our recursion. Um, and what we end up with is not only did it just make this thing run an order of magnitude faster, right? But it actually was also able to take our recursion and get rid of the overhead of the recursion. Uh, spoilers, it did that by just getting rid of the recursion, right? So it really did just turn, uh, and like you can look at the assembly. I think we already had this uh, as a lab exercise, but you know, you could go and disassemble this if you'd like. But really, even things like function calls. Right, the, the contract with the compiler does not say that it has to call the function because I wrote the function recursively. And if the compiler is able to see a way to make this thing happen in a, in a kind of just a purely kind of iterative manner, it'll do that. 
And, uh, and so sort of realizing, you know, taking a step back when your code kind of suddenly changes in these substantial ways and saying, okay, like, why was the optimizer able to do that? What impact, you know, did writing the code recursively versus iteratively have on the functionality of my program? What impact did it have on the output? Well, if the answer is kind of nothing, if it didn't, if it doesn't change the output, the compiler gets to just make those changes and does not have to adhere to your control structures, to your function calls, to any of that. Okay? Questions about that piece? Oops. So maybe at this point you're thinking, oh, sweet, like compiler just did everything, right? It just gave me like a 20x speed up on this like really simple factorial function. Like who even knows what it did there? It doesn't matter. I can just turn on the O2 flag and my code's just going to run faster. And um, that's, you know, maybe. Um, maybe a takeaway is, hey, don't reinvent the wheel, right? If there's, if somebody already wrote a really sweet optimization, then yeah, you should write your code in the most sort of straightforward way. If factorial makes sense recursively, uh, you know, if you're going to write a quick sort or, or whatever, like binary search in a recursive, uh, recursive structure, because that just is cleaner, then you can do that, and you can trust the compiler to get, to get the code to run quickly. Um, you know, kind of for you. But there are going to be a couple things, um, certainly, that we need to know about um, that we can do that our compiler um, is, is not going to be able to help us with. So let me show you a couple of examples of that. For the first example, uh, here you can see the kind of the so this is sort of a, a stir to lower kind of function, right? So maybe something you would have needed in assignment two, where here, one version, you can see I, I've got the usual for int i equals zero less than stir len i plus plus thing. And then down here, I've got another version where I've got the length just pulled out, right? So I've computed the length ahead of time, and I'm, I'm just going to run the for loop, um, run the for loop through. Yeah? So, we might say, you know, well, let's see if the compiler can help us out here. Um, so I'm going to use, I'm going to run demo two. I'm going to run it on stir lower, and we can see that okay, well, there, there was a huge difference, right, between calculating the stir len ahead of time in this case, and having the stir len calculated every time through the loop. And like, you know, that difference kind of makes sense, right? So how does strlen work? Well, strlen needs to walk down the string and find the backslash zero. So if I've got, if I'm going to do that every iteration through my loop, then I've actually turned what looks like an O of n loop into actually an O of n squared loop because this operation in itself is O of n. And so maybe we might think, oh, well, wouldn't it be nice if the optimizer could just get that right so that we don't have to do this? Um, well, it certainly helped in terms of just cutting down all the kind of just a little excess uh, overhead, but it was not actually able to do this. Um, and, so, and so why not? Well, the problem is, I mean, so, so it's going to depend a lot on, you know, the kind of uh, different assumptions that the compiler gets to make and whatnot. But in this case, the compiler was not certain that too lower wouldn't accidentally put a null terminator in our string somewhere. Now, we happen to know, just looking at the code, you know, clearly it's not. Take, it's converting a character to lowercase is not suddenly going to turn it into a null terminator. That would be problematic. Uh, but the compiler didn't know that. And so uh, this is a case where we could, as a programmer, could just say, all right, well, you know, my code is running maybe a little slower. This, this function looks like it's running, um, uh, you know, n squared versus n. Uh, I could maybe figure that out as a, as a potential bottleneck. You, some of you might have run into this for assignment one, right? And a very simple operation like this um, is actually, um, a very simple operation like this would actually just make your code run um, run way faster. 
um, and probably, and you know, in this case, not really compromise sort of the, the clarity of our code. Um, and I should say that, you know, we could imagine trying to get rid of this Sterlen call as well, but that's not going to help. And so I, I'd encourage you to, to try that, right? You could try getting rid of this Sterlen and, you know, rewriting this in a way that, that doesn't call Sterlen at all. But at this point, we're basically looking at an O of N operation anyway. And I assure you, the difference, um, the difference there is, is pretty minimal. So it's not to say you should write, you know, it's not to say that you should be really worried about this, right? One of the big, one of the big temptations when it comes to optimization is to get really, like, prematurely worried about this kind of problem and say, oh, well, anytime I call Sterling, I better just, you know, cache it in a, in a variable. I better pass it as a parameter. That's not really the right, um, really the right strategy here, right? We want to perform optimizations with a good understanding of what they're actually going to do for us. And the truth is the compiler is going to be pretty good for a lot of different things. And so we should pretty much always start by writing something in the most straightforward way possible. And then if it comes down to um, something that, you know, that, that the compiler didn't catch and our program is slowing down for that, and I'll show you how to measure that in a moment, then we can, um, then we can start talking about these optimizations. Okay? Questions? Quick question. Yep. So you said that it was n squared yeah. when you have Sterling in the. Yeah. Why exactly would that be n squared? Wouldn't it just calculate, like, wouldn't it just be like 2n? Ah, so this is 2n, right? You see down here, this one would be 2n. In the sense that I'm calculating the length ahead of time, so that's an O of n, right? And then this one is just going to run through um, in O of n. The problem is. If we recalculate the Sterlen every time I go through the loop, then that recalculation itself, um, that calculation itself is linear. So then you can think of every time I go through one iteration of this loop, I'm doing another O of n thing to calculate the length of the string. And thus I end up with n squared. Okay, anything else? So, so I guess another example I want to show you is, <laughs> this is an example actually of the opposite thing, which is that as it turns out, there are cases when writing the code the obvious straightforward way is actually going to help you. So here are two different functions. Um, these may very well be functions that, I don't know, might show up in Something like a heap allocator kind of design, but who knows? Uh, and you can see that one strategy that you might think is, well, gosh, I need to optimize my code. I need to make sure that, you know, and, and the way I'm going to optimize my code is, I don't know, like Michael told me division was expensive, right? So I don't want to do that. Here, I'm just going to, I'm going to write it out as this big block of if statements. And I'm just going to hard code all these numbers. And we're not even going to worry about the fact that, like, I hope I got all the numbers right. Who even, yeah, whatever. But um, and I'm just going to write that out. And that's, and that's going to be faster, right? Um, and then, you know, and then so then here's the other version, right? Which would, and both of these things do kind of the same, the same thing. Um, and so, all right, let's, let me run this demo. Uh, Let's do, I think I can't really call it, so I'm just doing it. Um, so here we can see, okay, well, in the unoptimized version, there's a pretty big difference, right, between the, so the, so the if statements, they're slower, right? Okay, so you might think, all right, well, well they're slower. Ah, oh, shoot, well, whatever. Um, it's okay, it was, I didn't mind copy pasting 10 times, whatever. Um, maybe the compiler is just gonna get it right. So hopefully, let's, let's count on the compiler, like, well, it didn't. And so, Kind of takeaway lesson here is really that, you know, sort of, we don't want to, we don't want to sort of try, it's like, for one, for one thing, you know, maybe one sort of the kind of mechanical takeaway is that if statements are actually pretty expensive, 
And so compared to, I mean, even this divide, I, I assure you the compiler was able to turn that into a right shift, right? Um, no problem there. Uh, but if statements are actually pretty expensive. And so uh, for one thing, if you can write your function more compactly, not only is this easier to read and easier to understand, it's also a lot faster. And this speed up is not something that the compiler is gonna give, is gonna be able to just give you with optimization. So uh, maybe you think that this piece doesn't, you know, oh, well, maybe, maybe the if statements just don't matter, or maybe you thought this was actually going to be faster, but one way or another, it actually is much worse. It's about an order of magnitude slower, and if that order of magnitude is happening a million times, then that's, uh, you know, uh, 10 million cycles instead of a million, and that's kind of a bit of a problem or whatever, right? All right. So... Kind of broadly, kind of speaking, right? High-level points. Um, the compiler isn't really going to be able to um, optimize away things that it can't quite, that it's not quite able to reason about all the way through. So, in the case of something like the Sterlen, it wasn't able to really be confident that the Sterlen wasn't changing from iteration to iteration, and so uh, it couldn't really, so it couldn't optimize that. And then in this case, uh, there's just kind of too much going on there, right? Generally, uh, the compiler is going to be much better at optimizing small, compact functions, you know, kind of cleanly written, normal-looking things than it is going to be able to optimize these really, you know, hard-coded, kind of messy things, uh, even if there is actually a good pattern. It's not going to be very good at just straight-up deducing a pattern out of, for example, a block of if statements. And then the other thing, uh, the sort of last thing I want to show you here, the other thing the compiler is not going to be able to do, and maybe this is kind of just a, a flashback to um, our discussion of big O, the compiler is not going to be able to solve our algorithmic problems. Right? So if I, if I write a selection sort algorithm versus um, the compiler is not just going to be able to look at that and be like, you know, actually, I think you just wanted to sort the array, so how about I call qsort for you? Not gonna do that. Um, so I can I can run I can run sorts. Um, you know, and we can see that so if between calling Q sort and calling selection sort, um, right? So we can kind of see it's kind of neat, right? You can actually see the n squared and n log n differential here, right? Um, this one didn't um, is not really increasing by, uh, right? So it, you know that's that's about a uh, a two x jump, right? So it's a little bit over, a little bit over, a little bit more than linear. Um, whereas over here, we're seeing a very qu clear quadratic jump. Um, and the optimizer uh, is going to do nothing, basically. Right? In fact, it, it actually looks like it got slower, which is a little interesting. Um, that's partly maybe a little bit in the noise, um, maybe a little bit just kind of variance, and but also potentially just kind of. The extra instructions, right? This this didn't help. Uh, you'll notice that um, quick sort didn't actually get any faster. Uh, why not? Right? You might think, oh, well, hey, shouldn't O2 be able to help quick sort? Well, this was actually a call to quick sort, right? Um, quick sort's in a library function, uh, in a library, and the library is already optimized. So, so you don't have to worry about, you know. So, for example, if you're deciding between, hey, should I call the C library or should I just write my own for loop? Right? Calling the library gives you not only the benefit of not having to worry whether your code uh, is correct, but also it means that you're just getting the optimizations pretty much for free, because the library is always going to be written um, and compiled with optimizations, and, and so we're already getting all those benefits from quicksort, even when we didn't optimize our own code uh, in this case. Yeah? So that's the kind of big picture thing I want to show you with the just like the different kinds of optimizations and the, the ways to reason about them. During lab, I'll show you a few, you know, you'll see a few other things um, that the optimizer can, can do um, and, and what, it, what it can do. For the remainder of the time, I want to show you how we can actually reason, how we can measure performance in a, 
you know, so all, obviously all of these examples have been constructed in this way that allow me to show you the number of cycles for this particular uh, function. And that's really nice for just showing you whether optimizations are working and, and what changes are happening. But you can imagine like walking into a, you know, if you have a big piece of code and someone hands it to you and says, optimize it, which, you know, which happens, what do you do? Right? What is your strategy? What is like, do you start throwing cycle counts everywhere and seeing what the numbers come out to? Well, there's an easier way than that. And so I want to show you that. I'm actually going to use a third terminal here. Okay. And so I'll, I'll show you, I'll show it to you on the sorts program first, and then I'll show you a bigger example just to kind of see how it, how it all comes together. What we can do is we can use Valgrind. But we're not going to use Valgrind for memory checking. We're going to use Valgrind, we're going to use the special tool called, a different tool for Valgrind called CallGrind. And what, so what we're going to do is, and this is generally the idea with optimization, right? We do not want to just guess. We do not want to look at our code and be like, hmm, I wonder if I should move that sterline out of the loop. Oh, I wonder if I should turn this, you know, this if statement into this arithmetic. That's, you're going to go down, you can just go forever and ever just trying to make changes. And I assure you, most of them will just do nothing. You will see almost no impact on a vast majority of the changes that you make because it's all kind of in the noise. What we really want to be doing is we want to be thinking about like what parts of our code are actually taking up a significant amount of time. Like that, you know, we want that information so that we can concentrate our attention on that. And so a program like CallGrind um, is going to allow us to do this. So I want to run CallGrind on sorts. I'm not even going to run it on the optimized version. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I'll run it, just, I'll, I'll constrain it a little bit to how much it runs because uh, it, it does take a little bit longer if I don't. So I'm going to run this tool called CallGrind uh, on sorts um, of 1,000. And then now I'm going to use this command, CallGrind annotate. This will all be in, in docs and stuff. So. Don't worry about rapidly scribbling down these commands. But um, and so actually, here, let me show you what the output was. Um, so what happens was, uh, what this tool does is it's called a profiler. And what it's going to do is it's going to run our program in kind of a simulated environment. And it's going to write down kind of every instruction that it got executed. And it's going to store the result into this file. And the number at the end will change every time. So then I can run call grind annotate pass this flag auto equals yes on that file. I'll pass it through the more command so it doesn't scroll off the end of my screen. And so we can start to see a couple things. Let me skip the first header here. Um, oh, it's, it, yeah, it's going to, all right, well, 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 it'll be okay. And so we can, the lines got a, are, are a little long, which is unfortunate, but we can see, um, so let me just tell you how to kind of read each of these pieces here. So at the top here, we have a summary of the, so this is actually measuring a number of instructions. It isn't really taking number of cycles into consideration, but as long as, um, but you know, we now feel that GCC was hopefully able to be pretty good about making our multiplies turn into ads and things like that. So maybe we're not so worried about cycles now. And here's kind of a summary of the, of the functions that are taking the most amount of time in our program. And we can see that the selection sort function in sorts.c, right, it was taking up the vast majority of the, of the instruction, instructions in our program, right? 4.0 out of 4.5 million of the instructions were going into selection sort. Yeah? And then if we keep going down, we actually get a nice little breakdown of all the instructions that are, are happening here. So here, let me uh, enter. I think here, let's just keep going down a little bit more. And we can actually see kind of, so we can kind of see for each line of code, you know, which, which is the expensive line. And so we can look here and we can say, okay, well, so remember, the, so now here in this case, we're sorting an array of a thousand elements. So here we can see that this for loop, roughly speaking, looks like it took up three instructions uh, per, you know, per element of the array. And likewise, so um, this call to swap, for example, uh, is taking up 5,000 instructions. So the way to read this is um, the 
is that this, so this is the line that's actually the, the swap function. Uh, this is the overhead for calling swap. Right, so here we can see that the swap function took up 5,000 instructions, um, and it took, a, and swap was called 1,000 times. Okay? And so, for example, if we were thinking, oh, well, I wonder if my selection sort is really slow because of the swap function. Well, we can see from this that the answer is nope, that's not true at all. Swap took up, you know, a very, very little time. What was taking up a ton of time were, was this kind of inner for loop. And that's sort of consistent with what we expect, right? That the, the n squared part of our algorithm, this, these two lines are going to be executed n squared times, and those are uh, what's going to take up the majority of, majority of our runtime. Incidentally, so what's really neat about this is we can actually start kind of lining up these instructions. So here, we can see here that the swap function took up 5,000 instructions. And we can say, well, why did it take up 5,000 instructions? So I'll do it on swap because swap is the easiest to understand, but we could conceivably want to do this for um, a function that's you know, taking up much more time. Um, so, let's, so let's break down those 5,000 instructions, right? And we can see the breakdown up here. We have 1,000 instructions that went into this line, 2,000 that went here, and 2,000 that went here. You add them up, you get 5,000. Cool, right? We, in fact, we can even go back to the assembly over here, and I can disassemble, while showing the C code, swap. And we see exactly that. We see that the first line has this one instruction associated with it, this next line has these two instructions associated with it, and the, and the last line uh, is being attributed also to the return. Um, uh, the return statement is counting towards the last line, but you know we've got another two instructions there. So we see the one, two, two, and if we go over here, we see the one, two, and two, but in this case, times a thousand because we called this function a thousand times. Any questions? So this is the kind of thing that we want to be able to do. Um, this is the kind of thing that we want to be able to start to sort of analyze, right? And so in this case, we can see that, OK, swap doesn't matter. Uh, the big problem is this for loop. I mean, really, the big problem is we called selection sort and not Q sort. But hey, like, you know, if we, for some reason, really had to write this n squared algorithm, then we can actually see that uh, this if statement, for example, is taking up a fair amount of, of, of time. In this case, we can't do anything about this, right? Selection sort just has to be how it is. Uh, but you know, in certain cases, and I'll show you one in a moment, uh, we could say, oh, I didn't expect that to be taking up that much time. Maybe I can try and change stuff around. Yeah? <clears throat> okay. So I want to show you a bigger example of how we can use call grind. And so this is going to just sort of, you know, show us that idea of like, what do I do if I have a big program, right? And I don't know where the time constraints are, and I and I just want to see um, see what's going on. Uh, I'm actually going to I forgot to do this ahead of time. I'm actually going to sort of simulate this a little bit, which is I'm going to. So here's the program. Uh, thesaurus. I took so this is the program from assignment two uh, or from uh, assignment three, the the test program that we gave you uh, for reading in a thesaurus and just kind of um, printing out synonyms. I got rid of the synonym printing part because uh, eh, whatever, like it that wasn't actually the the interesting part. So what I kept left what I left in was the reading of the thesaurus. All right, so we're basically going to read in the thesaurus and then we're going to throw it away. But oh well. And so we might say, hey, well. And so I'm going to leave everything kind of as is. I used a smaller thesaurus, by the way, because uh, otherwise it's going to take forever. But I'm going to change uh, in this. Uh, but I changed two things. Um, I changed the estimates on how large. Um, I changed the estimates for my C vector and my C map. Right? So the C map was storing, uh, each word was, was getting an entry in the C map. And so, and we were estimating before that it was at like 35,000 or something. Uh, right now I have like 10,000 words in this thing. Um, so we could say, so I'm changing that estimate uh, 
to something really small, and I'm changing the estimate for uh, C vector, also like the, the number of synonyms uh, for each entry, also to something really small. Um, you know, maybe because we just, I don't know, I don't know what the estimates are, right? But now I want to know, like, are either of these having an impact, and if so, which one? Right? How do I actually know, like, yes, that change was going to cause a problem, or that change was, was sort of, you know, had nothing, had no impact? So let me, um, let me do that. So I actually have to make again. All right. So what do we do? Well, we can just run val grind. We can run call grind, right? Uh, tool is call grind. And I can run thesaurus. So this is going to take a little bit longer, but hopefully it's. And so just to kind of give you a sense of what the plan is from here, uh, since it's, it's going to take a little bit of time, but not too much. Um, our plan is we're going to run this thing, and then we're going to look at the annotation, and we're going to try to find uh, where the hotspots are. Now, like, so, so I'm going to use this, this term uh, that I just flipped and used. Um, the, we use the term hotspot um, to refer to a part of our program that is, so in this case, temperature referring to sort of the amount of time you, you, you execute that line. So a, a hot region of code is a region that is executed a lot. And therefore, that would be a block of code that's going to get, uh, that, that would benefit the most from uh, some kind of optimization. All right, so the program is done. I'm going to run auto equals yes. I'll do call grind log. Uh, the output, so the number that the output is, is it's this number, right? So it's 2, 1, and I can just have complete. So here we get our nice little program summary. Um, we see that there's a, you know, a, a lot of instructions there, right? Uh, Two billion uh, total instructions that we had to execute here, um, and we can see that, well, gosh, uh, one billion of those are coming from. Okay, there's something from libc, but that's not going to be that useful. Um, the one that we're really going to look at here, we can see that find cell, is the thing that's taking up a lot of our time. Um, incidentally, you can see that actually. The vector one, right, is actually way down here. Um, that vector insert is not even on the radar, right? So let me come down and show you how we can actually um, look at this straight out of our code. So it's worth always keeping in mind, like, these are absolute instruction numbers, right? So maybe you look at the 12 million and you say, wow, that's a big number. Uh, but keep in mind what the total number of instructions was. It was like 2 billion, right? Uh, I won't go up and, and get it for you. Um, well, here, it's up there. Uh, keep in mind, you know, it was, it was up here, right? So 12 million, yeah, that's nothing. Right, so we'll keep going until we find the, sp the spot that was uh, taking up, you know, kind of all of our time here. Um, and we, we already kind of start suspecting it uh, is going to be right around. Um, all right, so here's our CMAP create. The CMAP create's fine. Okay, this is all good. And then, and then here we go. Um, <clears throat> so, yep. Oops. All right. So then we've got our. This is all. Here, where's the? And then, so here you, you can see um, that's it, right? That it's not that. So the call. So this line, this number, this forty thousand is saying that uh, the number of this is telling me the overhead of actually calling CMAP put. Well, it wasn't the overhead of calling CMAP put. It was that while sitting in CMAP put, we just like blew 2 billion instructions. Right? Um, and that seems consistent with the idea that I only gave you one bucket um, to hash into. Um, and then incidentally, you know, so we can actually start seeing that. So, so like 73 million are actually coming from this, uh, from this, from the stir dupe here, right? Um, or from the, yeah. Or the scan f, and then we got the twenty. Yeah, we got the twenty, uh, the the twenty million. So twenty million from the stir dupe here. So these are kind of two things that you know we probably can't do a heck of a lot about, right? Um, so now we kind of just have to like back up a little bit. Um, so we're always going to find a place that is taking up a lot of, 
you know, instructions, right? Like some piece is going to, well, unless everything just kind of is even, but that's pretty unlikely. And so what we have to do now is back up and say, is that necessary? Was that like, was it really necessary to spend uh, 2 billion instructions on CMAP put? Well, if it's a hash table, the answer is no, right? Like you should not need to spend some, this amount of time doing a put into a hash table because that's what hashing was supposed to give me. In contrast, do I really need to spend 73 million instructions uh, working through scanf? Well, probably, right? I do have to really just read through that, the, the thesaurus. So let's, so we can see that this is something we can change, right? We can go to the 10,000 over here. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. I'm going to remake. And now we can actually look and just say, all right, you know, for example, so now what can we, yeah, this, first of all, it's going to be way faster, right? So that was obviously, uh, you know, just much faster in general. Um, and now we can say, all right, well, let's do two, three, okay. Whoops, three. And so now we're kind of in this position where, first of all, much better, right? Um, 164. And now we can say, well, so you'll notice that I also, for example, I still kept the C vector uh, size small. Uh, but that's still really not, really not the thing that's gonna, that's still not really gonna, that's not the problem, right? So we can see the scanf um, is, is now the dominant factor. Yeah, the C vector insert was, was taking up 7 million, but that's not our problem. That's not our problem at all. And so, look at the malloc too, right, right, so the malloc, let me get down to that little section here. Uh, oops, did I keep going? Did I miss it? Wait, did I miss it or where am I? So you, you were just the okay, sorry. So, ah. Uh. It's easier to see from the very first the prioritized table at the very top. Is it okay? If you wish to do more again, go back. Sure. Let me do that. Yeah. So, so we can see that. Yeah. So the the idea is something like the the scanf. We're not going to do a lot about that, but the malloc, right, is actually we can kind of think about that's like out of the program that's. 12% of our time, right, if you just do 20 million into 164 million, 12% of our time was actually just spent figuring out, like, doing this malloc. Um, and, then, and then what's that one? That one's uh, more, that's another free or so, right, um, is going to be uh, 11 million of that. So that's, what, what like, half of that um, is going into malloc and free. So we can kind of go back now to this idea that like we kept saying, oh yeah, the stack is cheap. Use the stack. Don't use the heap for large things that you don't need. Right? This is something that is going to come up in assignment, came up in assignment six. Right? Don't use the heap uh, for something that is just like overly allocated because the heap is expensive. Well, now we can start seeing that that's something that is actually having a pretty substantial impact. In this case, you know, maybe we can't do a lot about that. Uh, we can probably conclude that uh, it's going to be pretty hard for us to optimize this program any further. Um, unless we, you know, have better ideas of, you know, the sizes of our strings, and maybe we could use the stack for certain things. Um, you know, do we need to keep the thesaurus around? But in other programs, right, we can start kind of looking at these numbers and thinking, okay, like, do I really need to call malloc this much? Do I really need to call free this much? Do I, do I need to scan f? And so this is the kind of tool that you're going to want um, when you approach uh, your optimization tasks, right? So this, this is going to definitely beat a lot of trial and error. I think we, you know, fine, you could, you could have just guessed that, yeah, okay, hash map, bad times if you give it too few buckets, but maybe you don't know if CMAP is going to rehash or not, whether that number is going to make a difference. Um, and so this is how you would approach the process of looking at a program and saying, okay, this is, this is what was taking my time, um, this is not, and this is something I can fix, this is something I can't fix, um, and just kind of, you know, reanalyzing re every time we run our program is going to be part of it, right? Like that the hotspots kind of, can be kind of moving around. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so hopefully that gives you a sense for like what heap allocator is going to kind of look like, like what the strategy is walking into assignment seven, right? You're going to probably be using call grind quite a lot here um, to say, all right, what is the, where are the parts of my program that are actually taking up a lot of time? Um, don't just guess. You won't find it. <laughs> so, right, use, use the tools that are at your disposal. Um, and you'll be able to kind of narrow it down pretty, pretty well there. All right, uh, when we come back, we'll talk about a different 
way of optimizing, I guess, uh, memory optimization. So we'll see you. We'll see you then.